Okay, so now we're back. Now we're going to go through what are the anaphora. There's actually several anaphora, but I didn't know that when I made this the first time. An anaphora, that's a technical term for a refrain, something that's repeated. In the Bible, anaphora, at, at least in the Greek, I'm, I haven't tested it for the Hebrew, but at least for the Greek, an anaphora is a repeated refrain which is a, has a specific purpose of bookending topics. In this particular case, we're talking about bookending the future. And the first time it's used is right here. I'm in Lego Homing, truly I tell you. And it's bounded at the future, had there been no church millennium, 94 AD. Because Christ is talking in 39 AD, which you know from 30 AD, which you know from this, because if you backdate 30 minus. 49 you get to when Te Herod was first started rebuilding the temple which is very important because this whole text is about the temple going down which is what Daniel had forecast and the 49 is Daniel's own dateline so it's very specific and clear what Christ is talking about from the get-go he's being rejected so the temple will be rejected 40 years later that will put Israel in the diaspora just like Daniel had predicted and that's why when you get to here, not one stone will be on another. Okay? That's why it's the 84 is the decree. Okay? Now this is occurring 21 years after the millennium. This happens to be in history known as the Kitos War, which precisely began because the temple was destroyed and not one stone was on another and the Jews wanted it rebuilt. So it's future, it's tied to the temple and he's warning them of that future. And he's using the phrase, the refrain, I'm in Lego homing to do it. Now I want you to notice a couple things. He's standing there talking to them. He's there, present. It's not, you know, his appearing is already there. He's there. He's appearing. He's talking live to them now. 30 AD. And he's saying something. The Lord is there. He's talking. He's telling them, look, the temple isn't going to have one stone left on another. And by the way, the year that this, you know, phrasing stands for, is going to be when the Ketos War starts because the temple is down. So he's warning them. So you're supposed to, when you got to this part of the history, and you see the Ketos War starting, which it started in Kirenica, which is was northern Africa, you should be thinking, okay, I stay out of it. This is divine decree, and they're not listening to it. So they're fighting over the fact that the temple is down. But the Lord said back in 30 A.D. that the temple would be down. Alright? That's how you're supposed to use that information. And of course, Paul ends up saying the same thing which I've shown before. Okay, but right now we're focusing on a technique that's used in Scripture to t bracket history. Here it's future history. To bracket history. And the first occurrence is here at what should have been the millennium 94 AD. The second occurrence doesn't happen until much later right here at what's going to end up being, so you add 30 years to this, this is 1110 plus 30 is 1140 and it runs from 1141 to 1148 AD. And now he's talking about the generation that sees this We'll see all this that I'm talking to. See all what? Well, look in history. That's the generation that in the same area, Jerusalem area, in the Middle East, will see the, the Crusades. Okay? So when you get to this time in history you, and you see, oh, I'm in Lego Humin again. All right? Then it's like, oh, he foretold this. 
the generation that sees all that happen. Not my generation in 30 AD. That generation that sees all that happen. See, this changes because so many people have misused this passage. The generation that sees all this happen. They were saying, well, how come the second advent didn't occur? Well, he's not talking about your generation in 30 AD. Now, wait a minute. I got to go cough. <clears throat> okay. So, this is second occurrence. Now, the distance from the first occurrence, and you either measure it before the recurrence or after the recurrence. It either is divisible by 3 or it's divisible by 7. 3 is a trinity meter. It's frequently used in the New Testament. It is used in the Old Testament, but I don't have as much, I haven't done as much work on the Old Testament to see how often. But Paul uses it a lot. And the writers use it a lot. And here we see it in Matthew. The time from the last one. See, the last one was up here. 63 at the close of it from the close of the prior one to the beginning of the next one is divisible by 3 okay so Christ's appearance is first of all measured by what he says and it's as it were he's appearing to you in later time, even though he's not on earth now, because what he says comes to pass, or because you're, you're learning something he says. Now that takes you back to verse 3, where that's exactly what they were asking him for. Is what's the sign of your appearing? So you got the you got three key elements, sign, you, and appearing. Here's the word for sign, samayon. Here's the word for you, say, it's in the genitive case, say. Okay, so. Appearing, parousia. Alright, so the whole rest of the text in Matthew 24 is focused on these three words. Sign, Christ, and then appearing. In addition to him already being there personally sp saying something. So, you know, red letter Bible kind of thing. Here's Christ actually talking. So he's actually there appearing. And it's really him. Sue. So, and that's the sign. Because what he says comes to pass. You see? it's So the whole text is playing on these three words. The first instance of which is him actually talking. I'm in Lego. Who me each time? So here he is appearing. In the form of, hi, I told you all this was going to happen, and here it is, the Crusades happening in the Middle East. And what's the importance of that? Because a lot of people stayed in the land in spite of the fact that it was overrun. And they had their Bibles with them. And the idea is to keep, to keep overrunning the land, because they're not supposed to be there, to chase them out. And when they go out, they take their Bibles with them. And wherever they go out and take their Bibles with them, they're taking what the Lord says, I'm in Lego homing, with them. So it's successive invasions of the Middle East to get the word out to people who don't have it. And to wake up the people who do have it, hi, you got the real word here, see it's coming to pass. This generation, everything's going to happen to this generation. Yeah, the generation of the Crusades. And at this point, we're looking at the Second Crusade. There's more to the story than that, which I've covered in previous videos. Because this is also the time when the Cistercians are busy translating the Bible, making copies of the Bible, and teaching the Bible. So they're getting the word out, and they're principally getting it out in France and Britain. But they also go down to Italy. They also go into Germany and other places. And in fact, this particular year is the year where we have the first Cistercian Pope. I've covered that in prior videos. But that's another way that the Word appears. The Word appears to you in person, Christ. The Word appears to you through the Scripture, the Word of God, through somebody that Christ appoints, okay, to carry it. 
and the person who's carrying it doesn't even necessarily know he's been appointed, but he is. Anybody teaching it, even if they're teaching it wrongly, it's still the word that they're translating and teaching. So they end up being, as it were, the carriers of his word, so he is appearing to the person who gets the word. He's appearing to the person who gets the word through somebody who got the word. Got that? So all those things are going to happen. And this in particular is important because a lot of the scriptures that we have are better manuscripts are coming from the Middle East. Okay, so in order to get them out to Europe, to Russia, because in this case it's ending up going to both, in order to get them out to Europe and Russia, there has to be an invasion of the Middle East. And that's why you have this next occurrence of Amen Lego Humin here. Because whoever Christ is talking to through his word, who has his word, needs to get out of the geographical area where they've got his word into a geographical area where they don't got his word. You see? Now you can do that voluntarily or you can do that because you're pushed. Here it's because they're pushed as well as voluntarily because this is the Cistercians here. It's really very clever the way Christ is doing it. And he does it again. And here's where this is, becomes really important right here. See this? Here it goes again. I'm in Lego Homing. This time, it's divisible by 3. Alright. But it's also divisible by 7 relative to the first time it occurred in 63 from when he talked, which was 94 AD. Way back up here. See? That's divisible by 7. Then you come down here to the third occurrence of Amen Lego Humin at 1540 in the schedule. And that's divisible by seven versus the first time it occurred. Okay, so the Lord speaks again. So this ends up having the, the significance. Wait a minute. <coughs> Excuse me. This ends up having the significance of the, of the Lord, of really important times when the Lord's speaking through somebody, through His Word, through a translation of His Word, through people who are missionaries or whatever. But a really important occurrence of it. Okay, now what is this? Well, 1540 plus 30 is 1570. What is that? Any historian will tell you that's the beginning of the English Reformation. In England. Specifically, that was the year when the papacy excommunicated Elizabeth I. Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry, my cold just won't go away. When the papacy excommunicated Elizabeth I. Now, I want you to notice what it says here the third time. Everything that the master has, he's going to give to that slave. Okay, see, happy, happy is the slave who, when his Lord comes, I'm going to cover that in a minute, the Lord finds him so doing the right thing. Okay, so England is depicted as doing the right thing, getting the word out, and that's, of course, what happened. They broke from the papacy as a result. They had already broken in 1533. They broke from the papacy as a result. This solidified the break. This solidified England as separate from the papacy, even in the mind of Catholics, because of the interference by the papacy into England's, England's own sovereignty. This, Elizabeth used that. It's like, hi, I understand you're Catholic. I'm not trying to stop you from being Catholic exactly. But, you know, the papacy shouldn't have any power over us as a country. And finally, the Catholics even in England, along with the Protestants, of course, agreed with that. And so from 1540 until what should be, um, 1570 rather, until 1640, that, that, see, that, that, this is short three years. There's a reason for that, but I'm not sure what it is. But that should, that's a 1637. When you add the 30, but it should be 1640 is when the English Reformation, technically, per historians, ends. All right. 
But somehow the Lord is stressing the fact that something happens three years prior, and I don't know what it is yet that he's stressing, to make an issue of this time. In history, per the Bible, 1,540 years after Christ dies, okay, is 490 plus 1050, 1540. That means there's a 70 year voting period of whether you want God. England gets to be the poster boy for that. It's because enough people in England voted to know God that history continued. That's what this is saying. Because, see, it's very complimentary here. God will give that slave everything, you know, the master will give that slave everything, put him in charge of everything he has. So England ends up being the poster boy. The English Reformation becomes the center point of history. Now, what does that tell you? That tells you that, okay, you've got all these false Christs running around. We know that from the earlier text. We've got all these false Christs running around, but not everybody's false. And not everybody is misrepresenting me 100%. And, you know, when you go back and you look at what people said about the Bible and all that in those old days, 90% of it is still false you know, false interpretation, but it's the real Bible. And they're not getting it 100% wrong. They're starting to get the gospel right, even though they explain it wrong. Okay? They're at least getting the idea right. Yes, you believe in Christ. Yes, you should have the Bible yourself. Yes, you should know the Bible yourself. No, there shouldn't be a Pope. It took that long for humanity to break away. And England, above all, was the one who did it. Okay? Were they crazy in their doctrines? Oh, yeah. We're going to go through more of that in a few minutes. But they at least got it. You get the Bible yourself. You learn it under your teacher yourself. There's not some great big pope that's standing between God and you. And yes, you're supposed to have the Bible, and you're supposed to learn it. And it turns out that England ends up being the poster boy for getting that concept out. It's because of what happened in England that there is a United States. And this is the number one reason why there's a United States. Because that's the reason we came to the United States. Is we took our Bibles with us. We didn't want, we didn't want the wars. We didn't want the Protestants. We didn't, or maybe we were. But we didn't want anybody telling us what to think about our Bible. We just wanted a Bible on our own. And to escape Europe and all their fights over this, we just went to the United States and that's how the United States was born. And that's where the Christ is going to go into it, starting here. This is about the United States, the formation of the United States. But before I get that far, i got to show you what else he's doing besides this. Alright, remember earlier I said that there are three key words. There was Samayan, Christ, and Parousias. Right here. It's a Mayan sign. The Bible is the sign of him. And it's him, not some false Christ. And it's his appearing to you via his word, illustrated most dramatically by Amen Lego Humi. Okay? There are more occurrences of Amen Lego Humi after. After. The Reformation. And like I just finished saying, it gets into the United States. And how do I know that it's getting into the United States? Because, and here's where we get into our Trump thing, the next occurrence of Amen Lego Humin is yet future to us. 2036. Something very dramatic is going to happen very soon. Because see, this is where we are right now. That's 2017. I'm going to come back to this, but as I've said before, this is basically saying that from this starts in 1960 all the way through here, apostate Christians are trying to politicize, which of course we see already, but that's what this text is, is arguing against. All right, It's not complementary versus what we saw in the English Reformation. They're trying to do what Elizabeth I refused. They're trying to take us back to a unity of church and state, which Elizabeth eliminated. Okay, I mean, technically speaking, you know, she's the Church of England and all that stuff. But 
what she fostered was a freedom to believe in Bible the way you wanted to, so long as you didn't use it to politicize. All right, this is the reversal of that trend happening right now as I talk. And they're using Donald Trump to try to reverse the trend. The name of the group backing Trump is calling itself Seven Mountains. And if you look up Revelation 17, you want to throw up. Because they're literally reversing the meaning of that chapter. They call themselves Seven Mountains. You can Google it. Or you can go on YouTube and just type in Seven Mountains. Type in the full two words. And see for yourself. To just type in Seven Mountains, Donald Trump, Seven Mountains, Rafael Cruz. Because Cruz is in it too. They're trying to unite church and state, which is exactly the opposite of what the Bible wants. I mean, what God wants. And they're using it in the name of God. So God is going to have to reply, and that's exactly what this text says. And replying, he said, so something dramatic is going to happen, starting in 2030 A.D., in the 2000th anniversary of his death, to repudiate all those stinking Christians who are revolving themselves around Donald Trump, Trump now, which they started to do under Jerry Falwell in the 1960s. This is all a culmination of a trend. You'll notice it's 56 years long at this point, because we're at the beginning of 2017. That's not going to go unanswered. And so, from 2023 to 2030 is going to be a very bad time in history, for the U.S. at least. Okay, and then something dramatic. And look at what the dramatic is. Ukoi da humas. I don't know you. That's what all he's going to be. He, it's going to be real clear to the world that these people who are politicizing around Trump, trying to unite church and state, are all wrong. They're anti God. And the movement started in 1960 with Jerry Fall on the so called silent majority. That's when the whole pro-life nonsense got started. There's never been a pro-life movement prior to that. And it's anti-Bible. Because you're not human until you're born. Genesis 2-7 tells you that. So they're just using God's name in order to get their political agenda accomplished. And he's going to answer that. And it'll be public. Just like, you know, the English Reformation was public. Just like the Crusades were public. It's going to be public again, starting in 2030 or 2023 to 2030, because this is a seven. This is a bad period. Tribulation quality. And it's going to end with everybody hearing him say, I don't know you. And that will kill the apostate Christians. Maybe literally, definitely politically, by 2041. I can't wait till that happens. I'll be dead by then, hopefully. All right? And then 2031, that wipes out the, the anti-Semites. Because this is a trend that began with World War One, World War Two, beginning of World War Two. I don't have enough time to explain why why that's true right now. But see, this is where we're going with the Amen Lego Humin. It's a dramatic statement. Okay? And it starts all the way... You know, when you read the history that goes with these statements... See, I'm in Lego Humin right here. That's 94 AD by the time it ends. Okay, by the time it ends, Jerusalem's overrun. Pretty dramatic. Alright? By the time he finishes saying the statement about the time. This is the Ketos War. That's dramatic. That's going to end up causing the... Uh, Bar Kokhba rebellion and the, the subsequent raising of Jerusalem and a pig temple. Alright? The second time he talks, this is also dramatic. This is the cr second crusade. It's the second crusade primarily that, be, that got to be so dramatic. Alright? The second crusade. And all generations are going to see this happen. Why? In order to get the Bible out of the Middle East and into the hands of people who need it. Because they were slow on the uptake about getting out of there. That's pretty dramatic. Most of our most important manuscripts are dating from this time. 
Okay, in other words, we have like the, the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, and those were 4th century manuscripts, but we didn't get them in the 4th century. They were sitting there. And they weren't found until later. Okay, one of the breakouts of a lot of the other manuscripts that occurred, occurred during these years. And particularly, they went to Russia. And particularly, they went to Europe. And that's how come there was going to be a Reformation, which is the third dramatic statement. Here, the English Reformation. Okay, and then coming up fourth is the repudiation of political Christianity, which is plaguing us today. Now, there's another occurrence in the future, but I don't know quite what to say about it yet, which is down here, okay, which is occurring in 2096 AD at the end of it, and then the actual statement of the context is here, but I don't know what to say about that yet. It's too far in the future for me to understand yet. Maybe I'll know before I die. And then the last occurrence is right here, and this is at the end of time. The time that's being reported to us anyway. Alright, so you get the impression now the anaphora at each point are divisible by three relative to each other, so it's a deliberate bookending of history. It also helps us know we got the syllable counts right. Or it's divisible by seven when it's really doubly important, such as right here at the English Reformation. Right here. And that's the only time in history where what he says is complementary to the audience. So now you get a real sense of, oh, now I know what this, this whole timeline is about. It's about getting the Bible out, away from the papacy, away from some ruler, some secular ruler, telling you how to, how to live your Bible life, from anybody trying to control the Bible, that you should have the freedom to have the Bible yourself and learn it yourself. Now that's what everybody did when Christ is talking up here. Alright, that's how everybody lived. Alright, he's quoting to them scripture. He's expecting them to know these syllable counts because everybody learned the Bible for himself under his own teacher. Somehow that gets lost in history after he dies. And so all of this is about the recovery of the method of having Bible for yourself, okay, which is most poignantly in, illustrated, and you can just look it up in history, in the English Reformation. They're the ones that started, you know, traveling all over the world with the, with the missionaries. It's not like the Catholics didn't do it at all, but it's because of what they did that there's an America. And that's a hallmark of America. That's our whole founding. Freedom of faith. You believe what you want. I don't like you. You don't like me. Doesn't matter. You're free to believe what you want. You don't tell me how to use my Bible, and I don't tell you how to use the Bible either. Okay, that takes us back to the first century, the freedom of the first century. That's what's so important about this timeline. Okay, and what's so bad about our time in history right now, and what necessitates him saying, I don't know you, to Christians is that they're busy politicizing, doing the exact opposite of what he did to free up scripture in the English Reformation. They're trying to turn back the clock to the bad times. So you can't sit there and say, oh, the terrible papacy, oh, the terrible Catholic Church. No, the Protestants are just as bad, and their movement right now with Donald Trump is exactly aimed at doing that. That's what the whole Seven Mountains sect of so-called Christianity is trying to do. Just go look it up. Look it up in Google, look it up in, in YouTube, you'll hear them talk. They deny the separation of church and state. They want to turn this into a Christian nation that's ruled by their apostate version of Christianity, and they want to take you back to the same horrible, terrible, um, tyrannical days that we suffered under the Catholic Church. So it's not just the Catholic Church, okay? You don't blame them, you just blame the religious types that want to take over politics and call themselves Lord. That's what this is about. And how do I know that? Well, because there are a lot of uses of the word Lord in this passage. 
And it's in those uses of the word Lord that we find more proof of what I'm saying right now, which will be in the next increment. We've just finished Amen Lego, who I mean is one of the anaphora. We're going to cover more in the next increment.